So now we can get into some real HLSL. Um, this is uh, garage shading. I think that's actually pronounced uh, Girard. Um, Girard was, um, or uh, Girard shading um, was invented by Henri Girard, uh, published in 1971. Um, obviously that's a French name. Um, I think in English we're probably gonna call it garage shading. Um, and basically it is smooth shading. I'll run it here so you can see what it looks like. Now you can start to see some definition in our model. Uh, this is probably more of what you expected to see um, in the first place with the shader because we were telling it how to color in all these triangles um, but all we got was a silhouette even though we told it you know make every triangle black or make every pixel of every triangle black or make it all um, you know, red or whatever color. And you would think, well, I should see the model. Um, but you don't. All you see is a silhouette. And um, that silhouette is actually ambient light, which we're going to discuss here in a little bit. And um, that's what you actually get on the back side here, uh, where the model's not lit up. You're seeing basically that same silhouette, except for on the collar um, there. Um, and so this backside is all ambient light. It's lit up by ambient light, um, which is basically what we looked at before. It's just one solid color. In this uh, case, it's basically gray. But the side that faces the light is lit up with the color of the light. And let's see if we can get on the face here. And so when a triangle faces the light, it gets lit up. And when it faces away from the light, um, it uh, gets basically the ambient color when it faces away from the light. And that's what gives us the definition within this model to make it look uh, basically 3D so that you can see something besides just a silhouette. And so that's what the Girard shader is all about. Now, this basically replaced flat shading, and uh, we'll take a very quick look at flat shading here just to show you what there was before smooth shading. You can't really appreciate smooth shading until you know what flat shading was before. So we've got the model made up of the triangles with the wireframe here. If I selected the correct shader, which I think I did, and um here I'm telling it make the water the model uh wireframe we really want to see flat shading solid if I've got this done right yeah there we go so this is um our professor zombie model uh flat shaded and um you should know notice that he looks very faceted like uh like a gemstone um you can really see the triangles that make up this model, or at least the quads. Um, here, like on the side of the head, if I can zoom in on that. Kind of, I made the controls on this a little bit difficult to operate. Um, yeah, some of these you can actually see individual triangles. That seems to work pretty good there. Um, but the, the triangles are, are very flat. Uh, they're like a flat surface. And so you can really see each triangle in the model, even though this is a textured model, um, and it's, it's drawing the model with texturing, it's still very faceted, very flat. And sometimes you want this flat shading effect. 
Um, you don't see it much anymore. Almost everything is smooth shaded, but sometimes you'll have flat objects and you, it messes up the look if you actually smooth shade it. A uh, cube is an excellent example of that. If you aren't careful with a cube and it's smooth shaded, um, the results can look pretty bad. Um, but unless you have a very flat object like a cube or a pyramid or something, um, generally it looks a lot better to uh, smooth shade the model um, than it does to flat shade. In the early days of computer graphics, flat shading is uh, basically all they had, and uh, smooth shading wasn't even an option. Um, because, uh, you know, this the smooth shading wasn't invented until Gerard uh, invented it or published it in 1971. And this model was actually drawn... Um, uh, made with a normal map and the wrinkles in the clothes I think I'm not sure how that's showing but it's probably just the color of the texture because this is actually the backside is still uh, done with this ambient shader it's still done with the silhouette shader but when you apply a texture for the color to that silhouette shader then you start seeing the texture and um, the lighting effect uh, is not as necessary um, to see what's in shadow here um, when it's textured and because it's done with one all one single color for this ambient uh, shading basically you see the color of the texture and you don't see the facets of the triangle it looks smooth shaded even though it's not um, the entire model is shaded the exact same way and the reason that these triangles really are apparent and that you can really see these triangles is because of the lighting. We're trying to light up the model and the lighting uh, really makes it clear that we're looking at flat triangles. And when we get into smooth shading here in a second, um, you're still dealing with triangles. The triangles are still flat. Um, they just don't look flat because of the illusion of smooth shading. And so I really wanted to get a good idea here of what flat shading looks like. Anyway, back to uh, smooth shading. Um, let me change this back to you, smooth shading again. So this is the same model with smooth shading and we're not using a texture yet so um, you don't have that. But this works exactly the same here except for it's smooth shaded and um, it doesn't really look, uh, you don't really see the triangles, it doesn't look like flat anymore. It looks a lot more rounded and smooth. But that's actually an illusion. Um, let me see if we can find some places on the model where the illusion is dispelled. Um, yeah, you can kind of see it at the uh, outline of the top of the head. You can see he's got a pointy head. Um, you, it's not like round. It's not round edges here. They're um, you. You can tell that it's made up of triangles because you have very sharp edges that uh, come to points and um, apparently with uh, I think tessellation shaders you can actually um, get rid of that but until you had modern tessellation shaders you couldn't get rid of it it's it's a it's a giveaway that the smooth shading is actually an illusion you can kinda see that ear there kinda pointy and tell that it's made up of triangles um, and when you see how this illusion is done, it'll hopefully start making some sense um, that the illusion is broken at the edges. And you can, let's see, where else can we maybe find some edges? Uh, the, oh, the back of the leg there, <laughs> very pointy. Um, and kind of breaks, if, if I could get some light back on there. Uh, which I'd have to change the code to do, um, you'd be able to see really how p uh, pointy that actually is. Anyway, um, 
So let's look at the actual Gerard shader um, and the code for it. So again, we have the exact same parameters. We um, uh, we uh, pass the three vertices, or I mean, I'm sorry, the three matrices, uh, world, view, and projection, um, to place the model into the scene, just like before. Uh, all that works identically before. Um, now we're actually doing some lighting, so we're actually going to start using some of these values. I think we use all of these here. We're still not using texturing, but now we're going to start using some of these parameters. Um, so maybe I should kind of go over what these actually are. So um, as you're about to see, the lighting is basically nothing more than a color and a direction. Um, your ambient light color here is what we had in our silhouette shader. Um, this is just a single color, like when we were doing the red silhouette, if you passed in red here, um, that would be the same thing uh, as what we're getting here. The silhouette shader is basically our ambient light color. And it's that color is going to be applied to everything that gets drawn with this shader. Um, you should probably thinking be thinking of the Blend Fong shader here um, and garage shading as um, outdoor lighting, like the sun. The sun doesn't come from a clearly, it's, it's basically just a direction. The light from the sun, whether you're standing on one side of a football field or on the other, the light appears to come from the exact same direction. Whereas indoor lighting, where you've got a light bulb or something, you can move a few feet and um, the lighting completely changes and it's, um, because the direction of the lighting, to your point, is uh, substantially changing. With outdoor lighting, you can move miles and it still seems like the light's coming from the exact same direction. And so that's really what this simulates. Um, it's not so great for simulating indoor lighting, although some games and whatnot will um, use this for indoor lighting. And especially when you use baked lighting, um, this uh, tends to work fairly well with indoor lighting. Uh, bake lighting is a totally different subject than HLSL here though. And hopefully I'll do some videos on baked lighting um, sometime this year, hopefully. Um, anyway, so you really have two forms of light here. You have the ambient light and the diffuse light. And the diffuse light is basically what we're calling the light. Like when we run this, um, we have this white light that's lighting up the model and then the ambient color is basically gray. So the front and the back are actually getting that gray color. Um, and you can especially see it like up in the mouth and places where it's on the front, but it's not facing the light. So it doesn't get that light. But even where it looks white, it's actually getting gray. And so the, the light color is this diffuse light color, uh, whatever you want the light color to be. And then the direction that the light is shining in is the direct uh, diffuse light direction. Um, and it is the direction that the light shines in, not the direction towards the light, which can be a little bit confusing. Um, and it's, it's nothing but a 3D vector. It's a, it's a vector normal. It's a normal. Um, it's a normal that uh, defines what direction the light faces. And then for this shader, we actually need to know where the camera is at. No, that's not true. We don't. Um, I think th I think we'll find out here in a second, but I'm pretty sure that this shader does not use the camera position or the texture information. Uh, but we'll need it when we go to, to do the blend fong stuff. The specular highlights will very much require that camera position for the lighting. Now this padding value gets into memory alignment, which you don't have to deal with in XNA. Um, we might have been able to exclude it from this shader since we're in XNA, but um, it, it'll matter a lot more in uh, DirectX. Uh, you get into memory alignment issues. Um, I believe that these parameters are passed as constant buffers, which you can't see here in XNA 
uh, one of the few differences between the uh, DirectX code shader here and the XNA code is that this will have a constant buffer. It'll be like a constant buffer structure. Um, it'll all be wrapped in in a conf, con. I'm sorry, constant buffer, and this will be too. Um, and the constant buffer is kind of like your vertex buffer, but it's used to pass parameters. And apparently XNA does this in the background without you really realizing it's happening. Um, and it's called a constant buffer because these values can be seen anywhere within this shader. So the vertex shader can see these values and the pixel shader can see these values. Um, it's like, they're like global variables. Um, and so you can constantly see these values um, anywhere within the shader program um, because they're in a constant buffer. Anyway, so I guess uh, we're not going to cover camera position because we're not using it here. Um, but this padding um, is used because these values, um, for reasons that I only vaguely understand, are supposed to be 16, what is it, 16 bit aligned? or 16 byte aligned. I think it's 16 byte aligned. It's whatever a float 4 is. A float 4 is the exact size of the alignment. Um, so let's see, so a float would be what? 4 bytes, I think. And then 4 floats would be 4 times 4, 16 bytes. So I think this is actually supposed to be 16 byte alignment. Um, go ahead and get that corrected now. Uh, although I probably have to go through each one of these and correct them. Um, Let's see, did I say bit? Oh, I got it right there. I just, uh, um, some of them I did and some I didn't. Um, I guess I put a little bit more thought in it and changed it. Anyway, so this padding value, um, the whole structure here needs to be um, 16 byte aligned. And so the float four naturally is 16 byte aligned, but a float 3 is not. It's 12 bytes, and so um, it's not 16 byte aligned, and so this float, this extra float, helps align it so that these two combined are 16 byte aligned, and the entire structure overall is 16 byte aligned, so that if you have two of these setting next to each other in memory, um, it'll be the the next one that comes along will be 16 it'll begin at a spot that's 16 byte aligned and float fours are 16 byte aligned because they're exactly 16 bytes you get four of four four float fours or a matrix that's going to naturally be 16 byte aligned and three matrices are going to naturally be 16 byte aligned but anyway that's why that padding value is in there in some of my direct x stuff uh, since we've already got that in there, some of the shaders that I do in the DirectX stuff, I actually make use of that value and put it to work. Um, but um, here it's just uh, padding to get the alignment uh, to be 16 bytes. And uh, it's not doing anything except for filling space and making sure that the end of this uh, structure uh, ends at a 16 byte alignment. Um, let's see not using the color map. Um, the vertex shader input is exactly the same as it was in the um, the silhouetted shader example. Um, the output has changed. Um, so our vertex shader now is not only going to have a position, um, but it's also going to have a direction. It's going to have each vertex is going to have a vector normal, a direction that says what direction that vertex is facing towards. And so three vertices is going to define a triangle. Each corner of the triangle will have a normal, a vector normal, that is an arrow that describes what direction um, that vertex faces. And so the way flat shading is actually going to work is it's going to interpolate the values between those three corners of the triangle so that if you're dead center of the triangle, you'll get a normal that is averaged between those three normals. So at that point, 
the normal would be the average of the three normals. If you get all the way to one corner, you'll get the output normal to be um, the value of that corner's normal, or that, that vertex's normal. Uh, move to another corner, you'll get that as the, the normal for that spot. Um, but any point uh, between those three on the triangle, it'll interpolate, interpolate between those three values, between those three vector normals for the three vertices, and you'll get an average that's based on the position on the surface of the triangle, uh, which is interpolation. And so now you're basically doing per pixel um, normals. Um, you're basically defining a normal or a direction for every pixel within that triangle. Um, because once it gets to the pixel shader, it'll interpolate between these three values. So let's look at that a little bit more in depth. Uh, but first, back, take another look at our technique. Uh, everything here is exactly the same as we looked at in the silhouette shader. Um, so let's get into the vertex shader function. The input and output is the same. I mean, the structure is, you know, now has a normal for the output, but um, we're still using the vert vert vertex shader output structure as the output here. And we have to define a local copy here um, so that we can start working on it. And let's see. I can't remember why I'm taking the position and hard coding the one there. I think I've eventually decided it was unnecessary and so I commented it out. Um, either way, whether it's commented or not commented, it runs the exact same. Um, doesn't really affect anything to have that line in there, which is uh, apparently why I commented it out. And also, uh, these first three lines work exactly like they did in the uh, silhouette shader. So that's why I spent the time going through that silhouette shader. Even though it's not that useful, um, it is the foundation for Gerard shading. Um, these first th three lines are identical. Um, the only difference in the vertex shader is this code right here. And we're defining that normal um, which in this case is a vertex normal. So we've got one corner of the triangle and we're going to define the normal for that triangle. Now the normals are set in the um, in the uh, modeling program. 3D Studio Max, Maya, Blender, whatever. You set your normals when you're modeling the model itself. And so the artist gets to set the normals in what direction each vertex is facing. And it's part of the uh, output that becomes your uh, export file, in this case the uh, FBX, which defines the model. But remember that the model, um, the position coming in that's stored in the vertex is whatever was in the file. It's not, it's starting out, it's not placed correctly into the scene. Um, that if you rotate the model and turn the model around another direction, that only happens when you multiply the world matrix times the position that was in the file here. Um, so when you rotate that model, the normal is still facing the exact same direction it was back here in the export file. Um, and so you really need to rotate it. You need to rotate it the same, wor the same way you rotated the vertex itself. So if you rotate the model, its vertices are going to get rotated and you also need to rotate its normals so that the normals will now be rotated and facing the correct same I'm sorry they'll be rotated and facing the correct direction and so we're going to mu multiply um, the, the facing of our normal here um, by the world matrix and this gets into I mean, this is matrix algebra, this is matrix multiplication. This normal is a 3D vector, which basically has to be, um, uh, what am I trying to say? It has to be made into a 4D vector normally, but in this case, it doesn't. That's what this float three by three is about. 
without this float three by three, um, you would have to make the normal a 40 vector, uh, which would basically be the X, Y, Z value of the head of the arrow. Um, and then the W value would be zero because it's a direction, it's a normal. Um, and instead of doing that, we're taking our four by four world matrix and throwing away the last row and the last column to make it a three by three matrix. Um, and if you watch the matrix video, you should know that those inside columns and rows, the, the three inside columns and three inside rows are the orientation. It's that axis alignment. It's, um, that's where the orientation information is stored. The uh, column that we're throwing away is the position of the vertex, um, which we don't need to... You, normals, uh, vectors, can't have position. They're not positions. This is just a vector normal. It doesn't have a position. All we care about is the direction. And so throwing away that position is irrelevant because we don't need that position information. And uh, then the bottom row is the zeros or ones to determine whether it is a direction or a... Um, position, since we threw away that last column, we can throw away that row as well, because all we have is the zero values, that is, all we have are the directions, which are the three axes, the X, Y, and Z axes. Watch the video, <laughs> watch the watch the world matrix, or watch the matrix video, and, and maybe this will make a little bit more sense, but um, yeah, you're just using those three internal values, which are the orientation. You're throwing away the position information, and you're getting a 3x3 three three matrix, which can then be multiplied by a 1x3 matrix, which is what this float 3 value for the normal, for the position of the head of the normal here is. And so you're multiplying a 3x3 three three matrix by a 1x3 matrix in matrix algebra multiplication, and storing... Uh, that value in the output structure's normal value. Or in more plain English, <laughs> to simplify that a bit, um, you're rotating the normal. That's <laughs> all of that just to say, yeah, rotate the normal the, the correct direction, or the same direction as you rotated the model in, so that it's facing whatever direction the model is now facing. Um, you rotated the vertices, now you need to rotate them normals. That's all that does, and it was a comp uh, complicated uh, explanation, but that's really all it is, is just turning that normal to face the direction that the model is facing. Um, and then, I'm not sure that this step is ab absolutely necessary. Um, I think at least in theory it's possible that you could have rounding errors, that the multiplication might introduce some rounding errors, um, that the normal might change in length because you're rotating the normal. Um, normal, of course, has to be a length of one, and it's no longer normalized if it's not a length of one. So um, I renormalized it here. I'm not sure that this is absolutely necessary. Um, I might actually remove this from the code and just see how it works. And if uh, the lighting starts getting funky um, over time, uh, rounding errors could be adding up and um, throwing the normal off um, and that would mean you need to normalize it here. And then the color, we're, I'm not using vertex colors in any of these examples. This uh, model class from X and A um, apparently doesn't contain the colors or maybe just the model didn't have any vertex colors, I'm not sure, but for whatever reason it's not passing these color values through and so I can't really show you how to use this, but in a lot of my stuff uh, in DirectX, I'm using a color value, and so this is basically where you would put it in. You would basically pass it straight from the input straight to the output. No change, just comes in and you send it right back out um, so that it's all going into the output structure here. Um, but we're not using vertex colors here, so um, I commented it out. And again, it goes to the rasterizer uh, after the vertex shader, and it's uh, filling in all the pixels within the surface of the triangle. And then it's passing each pixel to the pixel shader. 
And before, all we had for the pixel shader was a single color, which was the ambient color. Let's see if we can find it. Um, it's not the ambient color is not passed through these structures. It's not it's not part of the the vertex shader input. It's not part of the vertex shader output. It is a constant buffer value. It is a um, basically like a global variable. So both shaders can actually see this um, ambient light color here. And if we were doing the silhouette shader, we'd just take that ambient light color, which now can be defined in the main code in C++ or C Sharp, um, and passed into the shader as a parameter rather than just having it hard-coded. But then it would just take that ambient color and output it um, as the return value for the pixel shader as the output and we'd have the same silhouette shader. But here, we're gonna do garage shading, which is smooth shading and um, introduce some lighting um, into our shader and simulate a light. Um, we have to create some variables here uh, for temporary use. Um, maybe it's best to kind of discuss them as we use them. So the, let's see, our input, try to figure out why this is done this way. The diffuse light direction, oh, it's because, again, it's not in the input or the output. It's not in our structures here, the diffuse light direction. The diffuse light direction is a constant buffer value or a global variable that is passed in from the main program as a parameter for the shader. So you can tell it whatever direction you want it to face. And so the light is going to shine in the direction of this um, this vector. So this 3D vector of float 3 is um, defining what direction the light shines in. And so in our pixel shader, that's the first thing we use. We don't have to say input dot because it's not part of that input structure. Um, but here we've got this diffuse light direction, so we're using it, and I negate it. Um, I just say, I mean, you could say um, times, uh, you could say diffuse light direction times negative one, uh, which would be the same thing. Um, I'm just um, negating it, which um, in vector math, since this is a normal a vector normal, in vector math, when you negate a vector, it reverses its direction. It makes it turn 180 degrees in 3D space, uh, or in 2D space, depending on which you're in, which in this case we're in 3D space, but it'll rotate around and have the exact same length, but it will, the arrow, the vector will rotate around to completely the opposite direction. So the, uh, maybe I should have named this uh, direction to the light. Um, this is the direction from the pixel that we're currently drawing within the triangle. Um, it's the direction from the pixel to the light. So we're, we're at the pixel and here we're defining the direction towards the light. Where, where is the light at, uh, relative to where this pixel's at. So, and, uh, but again, we're just, um, reversing the vector to, instead of pointing from the light to the pixel, we're reversing it to point from the pixel to the light. And then we use that value from the pixel to the light, and we do a vector dot product um, with the normal, which uh, since it's passed as that input structure has to have input dot. And um, so this is the direction that our vertex faces, but it's gone through the rasterizer and it's been interpolated between the three vertices of the triangle from the three corners of the triangle so that it's an averaged or interpolated value um, that faces basically an average of those three, a weighted average of those three corners and their normals. Um, this normal is going to be a weighted average of those three values based on the position and how close it is to each corner. And so this is actually a pixel normal. It's the direction that this pixel 
faces. It's not it's not a face normal and it's not a uh, vertex normal. The face normal is what we get with flat shading where the entire triangle has one normal just for the entire tri triangle which is what we had in flat shading. And then um, vertex shading uh, uh, for garage shading here we are defining a vertex for each corner or I'm sorry a normal for each vertex or a normal for each corner to say what direction that corner faces but by the time it goes through the rasterizer it is interpolated to be a the the direction that the pixel faces the just this one pixel and you can't do this in X and A because it only does shader model 3 but in shader model 5 and DX11 you can actually say no interpolate uh, I think it is for the normal values when you define them here in the shader and uh, it'll give you flat shading because it will turn off the interpolation of the normals here and it'll basically just use a face normal and it'll make it flat shading and you can do that I think with other parameters as well in uh, DX11 where you tell it not to interpolate across the triangle whether it's color or normals or whatever it won't average the value <coughs> um, I think it basically means that you just get a uh, excuse me it'll you just get a um, a value for the entire face of the triangle anyway so we've got this vector dot product thing going on here so the way this uh, dot product works is you have two vectors you got one vector and then let's see another vector um, and basically one vector projects onto another um, if you imagine a light shining down this direction and uh, we have our two vectors here and that light would cause a shadow of that vector to project onto that vector and so the stop product thing is mostly about uh, doing projections you'll see it happening a lot uh, in 3D game programming it's not just HLSO you'll see it uh, with uh, uh, collision detection and other things um, where you're using vector dot products um, in this case we probably need our vectors to be normalized for this to really work um, so uh, both vectors here have a length of one which is uh, obviously not to scale here um, but you can imagine that this vector is casting its shadow on this vector to form or, and, and the value is a scalar so a vector is three values right like X Y Z um, and then a scalar is just uh, one value like a uh, or 7 or 7.5 or whatever um, let's see if I can erase that so when you do dot product multiplication between two vector normals um, it, you'll get a scalar value which is just like a float value um, you want the answer is not a vector you dot product two vectors together and you get a normal float value you don't get a vector as the answer um, however the you can think of the number that outputs of the dot product as being the length of this vector you can think we're forming a new vector right here along there um, that's gonna have the length of whatever shadow this vector casts onto this vector in fact I probably ought to call these normal since both vectors should be normalized um, so this normal will cast its shadow on this normal and will give you the length of the shadow vector um, it won't give you the shadow vector it'll just give you the length of the shadow vector however the shadow vector is the same direction as this normal um, it'll obviously be smaller here 
so it'll have a shorter length and it won't be a normal it'll be a it won't be normalized anymore because it's not one if this vector is a length of one then this is going to be less than one obviously and this point would be zero so um, it's going to be the exact same vector or the exact same normal with this length and since this is a normal um, its value is going to be it's going to have a length of one so if um, if this vector here is one comma zero comma zero x y z uh, one uh, comma zero comma zero so x is one so it's one along the x axis uh, zero along the y axis and zero on the z axis if this is in 3D and this works with 2D vectors or 3D vectors either way um, but you can see it easiest or we can demonstrate it easiest in 2D here um, so this length, the length of this vector, if you do the calculations, is going to be 1. It's kind of obvious in this case. If it were pointing at a different angle, it would be less obvious that it has a length of 1. But when we multiply it times a scalar value like 7.5, um, then it becomes 1 times 7.5 is 7.5, 0 times 7.5 is 0, and uh, 0 times 7.5 is also 0. So that was a bad example let me see if I can use the eraser here oh that eraser does not work okay let me hard eraser not working either oh you gotta love that there we go so uh, if that was instead of 7.5, it were 0 0.5, um, then the resulting vector is shorter. It's 0 0.5, 0, 0, and it's no longer normalized. It's still a vector, but it's not normalized. So the answer to the dot product would be like 0 0.5, uh, for example, which would be the length of this shadow. And then if you multiply that times this vector, um, the answer gives you this vector represented by that right there, um, which points in the same direction. It points in the same direction as that vector. So since there was a little bit of space there, um, so this vector points in the same direction as that vector. but it has a length of 0 0.5 now. And um, so anyway, all that to say that the dot product basically creates a shadow, uh, basically you have two normals, and it projects one normal onto the other to create a shadow of that vector on the... the <laughs> Hopefully this is not as confusing as it's starting sound in my head, but um, the first vector casts a shadow on the second vector, uh, resulting in the length of a third vector, which points in the direction of the second vector, um, but has a length of its shadow. Uh, or, or basically this the result, once you take the result and multiply it times the second vector then you'll get a vector which basically is the shadow cast by the first vector onto the second vector wow that <laughs> I think I made that a lot more complicated sounding than it actually is it's really simple it just you're you're casting the shadow of one vector onto another and getting a new vector um, that is the shadow and so all of that to say that we're using the vector dot product to calculate the angle between two vectors. So again, if we have two vectors, you get one vector here. And if you had another vector that pointed in the exact same direction, the length of its shadow would be 100% of the length of the other vector since both vectors are normal 
and you do the vector dot product, um, it'll give you 1.0 as the answer that's basically saying the shadow is 100% of the length of both vectors <laughs> because they're the exact same vector. Um, so when the angle between the two vectors is zero, the dot product answer is 100%. It's 1.0. And then in another scenario, if uh, we've got a first normal, and wow, that's uh, really kind of crooked there, huh? Uh, let's see if I can draw a straight line. Okay, pretend that's a straight line and that's actually a uh, 90 degree angle. That's a, like a right triangle. That's a 90 degree angle right there. Um, so, you know, if you imagine that light shining down and the shadow being cast, um, basically there is no shadow because uh, it's 0% of the length. So when you do the vector dot product, the answer is going to come out 0 uh, between these two normals. And so you can see between 0 degrees and 90 degrees, you get this uh, continuum of values. You get um, values between 0 and 1. And um, so the vector dot product can be used to calculate a percentage of the angle uh, between two vectors, uh, whether it's between uh, a percentage to 90 degrees, where um, 1 is 100% and 0.0, uh, 0, .0 that's 0%. And so if we had a vector like in here um, projecting, you know, straight down to here to give us a value of, say, something like 0 0.75, for example, um, the, if we multiply that 0 0.75 times this normal here, it'll give us this normal, which... Um, I mean, this vector, that's not normal if it has a length of 0 0.75. But that vector would have a length of 0 0.75. It would be 75% of the length of uh, that vector. Um, and so anyway, this can be used to calculate the angle between two vectors, which is uh, what we're doing. And the answer is very conveniently a percentage. Um, going back to our HLSL code here. Um, that's exactly what we're doing here with the vector dot product. We're taking the normal of the pixel, the direction that the pixel of the triangle is facing, and we're multiply or yeah, we're doing a vector dot product with the direction from the pixel to the light. And so if the normal is perfectly or if the if the direction the pixel is facing is perfectly aligned, with the direction from the pixel to the light, the answer will be 1.0 or 100%. So, since we reversed the direction of the light here, we're basically saying, in this dot product, we're basically saying, um, if the pixel faces the light, that's basically what we're saying here. If the pixel, um, if the pixel direction defined here and the light direction defined here are looking at each other, the light is looking at the face of the triangle, the vector dot product will be 1.0 or 100%. And if it's 90 degrees away from each other, if this value is 90 degrees or greater um, from the direction from the pixel to the light, if it's greater than 90 degrees, then the dot product will be 0 or 0%. Zero um, and between 0 degrees and 90 degrees, um, it will be a percentage. So if it's halfway between those two angles, it will be 50%. If it's 40% of the way between uh, those two uh, angles, it will be 40%. Uh, the answer would be 0 0.4, which would be 
And so that's what this dot product's doing. It's calculating the angle between um, the pixel normal and the direction of the light. And if it faces into the light, it gets 100%. And if it is facing 90 degrees or greater away from the light, it, uh, the result is 0%. The saturate is used in HLSL to make sure that values don't go beyond 1.0 or they don't go beyond 100%. I'm not even sure that's really necessary. I'm not even, not sure why. I'm, I'm sure I saw that in a shader somewhere and decided to throw that in, but I'm not sure it's absolutely necessary. The So we're storing that percentage value in the diffuse light percentage, uh, which is just a float value. It's a percentage um, between 0 and 1.0 with 1.0 being 100%. Um, the next line's commented out, so we're here with the diffuse light percentage. We got our percentage here. And then we've got our color, the diffuse light color, which was defined where? Um, actually, I don't remember. Oh, um, it's a parameter. Diffuse light, yeah. Okay, so it's our color. It's our RGBA color value. And um, so it's going to go between the color and black, basically. Um, if you sit and think about it a minute, um, the diffuse light color being RGBA, red, green, blue, if you multiply that times a percentage, well, if it's 100%, 100% times 100% is going to be uh, 100%. 100% uh, times 50% is going to be... Um, 50%. So like say the color is uh, red, which would be 1, 0, 0. Um, then you multiply times 50%. The zeros are going to be unaffected because 50% times 0 is still 0. The 1 will become 0 0.5, which is 50%. And so the new color will be 0 0.500, 0, 0, which actually is still red. It's just um, halfway to black because when you get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 is a comma 0, um, the color is black. And so um, you're darkening, you're, you're going to, you're fading to black um, with this percentage. So again, leading up to here, basically what we've calculated so far is that if the pixel faces into the light it gets 100 percent of the color if it faces 90 degrees or further away from the light it gets black it gets zero percent of the color um, and if it's an angle between zero and 90 degrees it gets a percentage of the color based on the angle between uh between the two the angle between the uh light and the um, pixel facing which we had to reverse so it's actually the the normal between the pixel to the light and the normal that the pixel is facing in the, or the direction the pixel is facing in angle between those two is what determines how much uh, of the diffuse light you get and it just gets darker and darker the further it faces or the further it is unaligned with the light. Um, and again, anything that's greater than 90 degrees gets black. And so without the ambient light, um, you get um, the shadows as being pitch black. Again, saturate um, forces it to be no greater than 1.0. Um, since the output here is a color RGBA, um, none of the float point values will be allowed to exceed one. None of them will be allowed to exceed 100%. Um, which, I suppose if the diffuse lighting calculation somehow got to 200% or something like that, um, then yeah, that could go out of range. But um, with this code, I don't think that's actually going to happen, and so that saturates probably not necessary there. Um, but anyway, so this new light, which is the amount of light that, that this pixel receives of this color, um, or it is the amount of this color that this pixel receives, is stored as the diffuse light value here, which is an RGBA color, a float 4. Um, 
let's see, that's going to be used in the next calculation. Diffuse light here. We skip a line and go here. And so we're taking that ambient or silhouette, silhouette light color and adding it to the diffuse light color. If it goes out of range, we force it back into range so it can't go beyond 100% for any color. Um, that saturate might actually be ne necessary. Although I think it's pr the graphics card is probably going to naturally saturate it. So I'm not sure if that's necessary either. But um, it'll keep it from going past 100% output color so that is our final output color that is the color of the pixel um, it's a combination of the silhouette ambient light color and the directional light color or diffuse color that we just specified so I might take this opportunity to uh, say something about these names here diffuse light and ambient light I think the names are, are absolutely terrible um, they're completely nondescriptive and they're more confusing than anything. Um, in the real world, the fuse light is light that doesn't seem to come from a specific source. Um, the, it's it's a, it's an enormous light that uh, leaves extremely soft shadows, which the sun is enormous is an enormous light but it's not diffuse it's very direct it it, it leaves hard shadows um, the, or the edges of the shadows are very hard um, I would not consider the Sun to be um, diffuse light at all um, diffuse light tends to not leave shadows like diffuse skylight would be like a cloudy day where you can't see the Sun the Sun's totally blocked out all you have is clouds and so the light seems to come from everywhere. There's no directional light. And so the shadows pretty much disappear since, you know, the gray clouds are lighting up everything. And shadows go away. There are no shadows. That's diffuse light. <laughs> and that's not what this is. So it's, uh, I don't know who the rocket scientist was who thought we should call this diffuse light. But um, this light is not diffuse. And then... Um, ambient light um, is basically the same thing as diffuse light um, ambience is like from the environment and so ambient light is from the environment it's basically light that comes from every direction would be ambient light and that doesn't exactly describe the, the, the name ambient light kind of works here but ambient and diffuse is basically the exact same thing so I mean, the problem really, I guess, is that diffuse light um, has a horrible name and uh, doesn't make any sense. And it basically means the exact same thing as ambient light. Um, so if you're thinking, if you're trying to figure out those names, don't, because they don't make any sense. Um, but it's an industry standard. I think uh, Gerard and... Fong and all these guys that came up with this stuff chose these names or something because they've been around forever and everybody uses these names. Um, they're industry standards and so you can't really do anything about the fact that the names are just incredibly stupid. <laughs> so um, anyway, that is what it is. And um, I used the names here because they are industry standards and you'll see them used uh, all the time. And so just to keep it straight, um, I just use the names that everybody else uses there. But diffuse light is really more of a, um, a direct light um, uh, or really directional light um, is maybe what it should have been called. Directional light and ambient light. And the directional light is kind of like sunlight that comes from one consistent direction. Um, you only have one light source that covers the whole area. And uh, ambient light is basically the light that's in shadows. Um, you um, the shadows are um, never pitch black in the real world. If you look at a shadow, you know, go to the side of your house or something and look in the shadows, it's probably going to be pretty bright. Um, it's definitely not going to be pitch black where you can't see anything at you know, three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, at least the shadows won't be if the sun disappears or something, maybe. Um, maybe there won't be anything but pitch black. But um, 
you know, if it's if it's three o'clock in the afternoon, there's sunlight out, the shadows are not going to be uh, pitch black. Here, I commented out the ambient light, so you get nothing but the direct light. And lo and behold, when we turn this around, you get the silhouette. You get that black silhouette because all this is is ambient. I mean, I'm sorry, directional light, diffuse light by itself. Um, and so the backside gets no color. The pixel or the pixels get black is basically the color they wind up with, which is essentially the lack of color, no color. And the front gets the directional light color, which turns out to actually not be white. Um, it's actually kind of a light yellow, and it, the model tends to look kind of gray because the way the shader's set up. Um, but it's basically a yellowish, like a dull, or I guess it's actually bright yellowish light. And the areas that are getting less color um, get more grayish until they turn to black. So it's you're you're kind of interpolating values between the color and black. So anything that's not facing perfectly into the if it's facing perfectly into the light, the bright areas there will get the the light color. But it's going to basically mix with black and turn gray. Um, and more and more dark gray until it eventually turns to black as it faces further and further away from the light. Um, so again, yeah, I just commented out the uh, ambient color there. And we already saw what the ambient color by itself looks like. The ambient color by itself is the silhouette. Uh, but when you combine the two, it combines um, both colors. Let's look at the colors that are actually defined here for ambient light and diffuse light. So ambient light is defined as 30% red, 30% green, and 40% blue, which is, uh, what is that? It's, it's a gray because when all three values are equal, if they were all 30%, it would be a gray. It would be 30% gray. Um, and the RGB, the blue value, is a little bit brighter. So it's going to be a slightly bluish gray. Um, it's going to have a little bit of a blue tint, which would be, or it would also be kind of a dull, darker blue. So that's kind of like the, in the shadows, in the real world, and like you think outdoor lighting, the ambient light or the color that goes into the shadows is mostly reflected off the sky or refracted off the sky. Um, so it's really that blue sky that tends to light things up uh, in, during the daylight if it's not in direct light. If it's in shadows, that tends to be the primary source of light is that blue sky. And so making the shadows kind of bluish um, but dark is what I did here. And then the direct light color is 100% red, 100% green, which is yellow, and then 80% blue. So it would be white if all three values were 100%. Um, and so I'm removing some of the blue color which leaves red. If that blue became zero, I'm, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry. It's not red. It's uh, yellow. If that blue value went to zero percent, you would get uh, lemon yellow. Um, it would turn extremely yellow. Um, and we'll look at that real quick here, and show you why you don't want to do that. Um, because it, the light becomes extremely yellow. <laughs> you're, you're you're using lemon yellow for your light source color and um, so uh, things become extremely yellow that's not really what we want by putting some more blue in it and taking it a lot closer to white um, we're getting a very bright kind of pastel yellow it's um, just a very uh, it's an almost white yellow I think would be the best way to describe it so we're getting that sky blue with a very bright sun yellow and the two actually kind of combine into a fairly nice 
white in the white areas. Um, so I'm pretty happy with that. When we get the texture values on, I think the lighting will actually look pretty decent um, and pretty normal. Uh, but you can play with the the colors and uh, the colors of the light and see what you like for the scene. Um, you might want to make the direct light more bluish uh, for a nighttime scene. Um, if you're thinking of the whole scene being lit by moonlight or something. Let's see, where were we? And that's basically uh, everything for garage shading. I mean, that's uh, that's all there is to it. The lines that I've commented out are uh, for the color, the input color. Uh, everything's basically the same here. I'm not sure that these parentheses are actually needed because the order of operations is basically going to multiply all this together. But um, I'm basically just taking that um, direct light, the diffuse light, and combining it with the vertex colors that we're not actually providing. With the vertex colors are commented out, which is why this is commented out. But if we were giving vertices a color, um, this is basically how you would use that here. And so instead of our model color basically being gray, um, if we were supplying vertex colors, those colors could be used um, instead. So if we made our entire model blue as by assigning all the vertices in the model the color blue, then um, instead of looking gray in this situation, it would look a lot more blue or green or whatever color we assigned to it. Um, I don't want to get too deep into vert vertex coloring here. Um, but that's how you do it. And then this line here, when you're determining your final color, uh, would be more like this, although this comes from the blend fong shader. So, uh, we've got values in here that, uh, we're not really supposed to have yet. Um, but basically you could combine that color in here. And so sometimes we've got these, uh, multiplication combinations going on and sometimes we get the addition combinations going on and I'm still kind of figuring out how this works but um, basically I think when you add two lights together um, it adds them together and so it becomes white and oversaturated or it blows out the, the color pretty quick um, you know if you're you're basically adding one light to the other as like you're just shining two lights into the same spot um, with the multiplication, it's more like an average of the two colors with the, the multiplication. So, okay, yeah, so let's look at uh, white light and 50% gray light as an example. Um, for the addition, the white light is already white, so you can't get any more white than that. And so adding 50% more light to the white is just going to result in 150% white, which there's nothing beyond 100%. It's just going to blow it out to 100%. It's not going to change anything. The result is going to be white light. Whereas if we take the exact same colors um, with a 100% white and a 50% um, gray, or 50% white, um, and we multiply that together, the result is going to be 1 times 0.5. The result's going to be 0.5. Or the 50% gray is going to be um, the output result. So it actually went... It's combining the two, but it's basically taking the lowest values um, with the multiplication. And then with the addition, it's actually adding them together, and if they exceed 100%, then it 100% is the maximum. Um, so it, it works a little bit differently when you multiply or when you add. Um, I've still been kind of playing around with uh, how it's best to combine these colors um, to get the best looking results. Um, but you can kind of play around with uh, combining the the colors to yourself to uh, 
um, see what you prefer. But that's pretty much it. Uh, that's garage shading, um, which is the basis for um, pretty much every other shader that you're going to make. Um, it's the basis for um, everything that we'll be looking at in the rest of these, um, in the rest of this HLSL series. So I think the next thing would be um, fong shading, I believe. Um, yeah, fong shading. Um, so I'll see you in that video.